Okay, this is the Sports Inquirer here with Beth Van Fleet, the head coach of Georgia State Beach Volleyball. You finally opened up your season and you had your tournament uh, down in uh, down in Florida at the Seminole Beach Classic or Bash. Uh, mm -hmm. Overall impressions, how the team performed, and then we'll get to specifics of the the groupings. Sure, we had a very successful opening weekend. We started our first day playing the number six and the number eight teams in the country and played pretty well. I would, I, the team agreed. We didn't really play to our standard, but it was a lot of learning and it's a great opportunity playing against West Coast schools because they're not in our conference and those games don't really factor into any sort of national championship decisions. And so it was a great, in a sense, um, warm up for the whole season for us. And then we came back on Sunday and got to play against a really strong Tampa team and Southern Miss. And we played, uh, we executed our, our game plans. We served and passed much better, kind of got some of those first day jitters out. Yeah, against Loyola and uh, Cal Poly, your, your group in uh, position three, Kelly Dorn and Megan McCall, they were able to win both of their matches. Uh, what about them in that three spot and what you saw from them? Yeah, they um, were kind of a last second pair for us and they played so well. It was really nice to see them play really without any expectations. They focused on serving aggressively. Both of them have incredible serves that are great weapons. And then just working on siding out and running a little bit of a lower offense. And they were able to do both of those things well and really put a lot of pressure on their opponents. Yeah, and then that second day against uh, Tampa and Southern Miss, your other pairings went undefeated from uh, Elise Saga and Bella Ferre and some of your other groupings. Uh, what about them and them being able to get their first two wins of the year? Yeah, I think it was really exciting, especially uh, with Bella being her first college win. Um, that was exciting for Bella and Elise to be able to share that. Uh, but yeah, I think across the board, we, we just talked on Saturday about what it felt like to kind of let an opportunity slip through our hands and how we were done with that feeling for the rest of the year. And so I think every, I know everyone showed up the next morning, um, ready to compete and ready to challenge ourselves a little bit, take a couple more risks and figure out kind of where some of those comfort zones end and greatness begins. Yeah. It looked like you kept the, your same groupings and your same positioning through those first four matches. Uh, was that intentional or is that something you realized after those first two matches that you wanted to keep it going uh, for the Tampa and uh, Southern Miss contest? Yeah, that was, we had a lot of questions and a lot of discussion about that. There's certainly, um, we thought after the first day and kind of letting people work through the jitters, we we believed that everyone played pretty well, um, but nobody really stood out other than Kel and Meg. Um, so that really wasn't a reason to, or a compelling reason to make any changes at that time. We're looking at making a couple of changes this weekend, um, but we'll see how those play out as we move into the weekend. Well, how do you make those decisions? Is it something you see in practice? Is it something that you reviewed over this weekend? I'm sure you're able to look at some of the, the things that were going on. How do you make those decisions with your pairings for this weekend? Yeah, that's a great question. So we actually had. Um, Kelly and Meg playing together because Kelly's regular partner was out for the weekend. And so she's been cleared to come back. So that's kind of going to change some things around with some of our pairings. And we're trying to figure out what pairs put our team in the best position to be successful this week. So uh, we look a lot at film. We do a lot of um, individual meetings and pair meetings with the athletes and do our best to get a sense of the pulse of the team to because um, they're the ones that are in the battle. They're the ones that are fighting. Coaches get to sit on the side and we get to have one perspective, but the perspective that really matters is of the athletes in the game. And so the more we can understand through their eyes how they see the team being the strongest, uh, we try to take that into account as we're making decisions. How do you watch the match? I'm intrigued by this because I see in other sports like tennis where there are multiple matches going at the same time. It's kind of tough for coaches to see what's going on. Uh, what about you uh, and I'm sure your assistants as well? Do you have a specific, do you specifically go to one match that you really want to give some guidance to, or maybe a team you trust a little bit more, you kind of let them do their own thing or do you, a, just ro yeah, ro so do you rotate through the match? How do you handle all those matches we, going um, at the same time? It all kind of changes day to day. Like um, if one of us is coaching with a flight that we're helping them and we're making an impact in the game, then we'll stay. If a if 
if we get up by five or six points or the other team gets up by, by five or six points, that's not necessarily something that a coach is going to have a bunch of influence on. So that might be a game that we step away from if we're shorthanded on another court. This last weekend worked out so well for us with re regard of when the timing started between um, with four, five and six finishing and one, two and three starting. So um, we are our, our flight one. They went without a coach several times, but we were able to have coaches on the other courts um, for most of their games. And the uh, flight one with uh, Maddie and Eden, they sometimes do better without a coach anyway. So that worked out well. Yeah, and now you're heading to the Tiger Beach Challenge in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and including a, a matchup against a ranked Louisiana State uh, on Sunday, March 7th. But before that, you have three matches uh, against uh, Houston Baptist, uh, Arc uh, Florida Atlantic, and Florida State. So another active period mm -hmm. for you. How is the team holding, uh, preparing for this? And physically, how did they recover just from the previous weekend? And you're now ramping up for four more yeah. matches. Yeah, once we start, it's a, a crazy sprint through the end of the year. And it just goes by so quickly. So we do take a lot of time to focus on recovery. We usually have Mondays off and athletes will come in for treatment um, and do some sort of recovery session, but we try to limit impact on Monday and Tuesday with regard to jumping. Um, Wednesdays and Thursdays, we're a little bit more physical in practice. And then Fridays, we have our site warm up and Saturdays we compete. So going into this weekend, this is a huge weekend for us. Um, FAU, I think is currently ranked 11th. Florida State is two and LSU is one in the country. So it's incredible to have so many highly ranked teams on this side of the country, finally. Um, but it's going to be a really fun weekend for us because these are all schools that we match up with really well and generally play very hard against them. So um, definitely excited going in as the underdogs. We like being in that position and we take a lot of confidence in that in that role. Actually, I want to go back to earlier conversation. You mentioned those matches against so Cal Poly and Marymount did not, in fact, did not have a significant impact on your NCAA chances. Uh, for those who are not familiar with how the setup is, what does that mean? Do they not... They're not non-conference matches, so they do not affect your rankings or your positioning. What does that really mean for, for people? Sure. So the way, so there's a committee that decides which schools will go to the national championship. And the, the layout has been in all the previous years prior to COVID, three, the top three schools from the East Coast, the top three schools from the West Coast, and then two wild cards. And so only once in the history of the sport has a wild card gone to an East Coast school. We're not sure this year with the um, COVID and limiting travel, how the wild cards will work out. So our goal, and as we're setting up our schedule and as we're going into competition weekends, our goal is to play hard and play as well as we're going to play against the East Coast schools. So that is, um, that's generally our focus. So anytime we get to play West Coast schools, it's, it's really fun to go compete and, and see um, you know, how we can grow and, and what our strengths are, but our primary focus is going to always be on the East Coast schools. Okay. Well, coach, thank you for your time. We appreciate it and safe travels to Louisiana. Thank you so much, Marcel. It's great to talk to you. All right.